Nothing will prepare you for the most involved teardown I've ever done. This is Nothing Phone 1. Hi guys, welcome back to another Hugh Jeffries video. It's come time for another teardown and repair assessment video. This time, a new phone company named Nothing. Can this phone prove more repair friendly than the competition or will it have nothing on offer? Like usual, I purchased two to find out. Opening up the box, you'll find the phone and an accessory packet. The accessory packet doesn't have much in terms of accessories, but neither do most new phones. Just a USB-C cable, SIM eject tool and paperwork. After unwrapping the phone, it's time to get the second one out of the box. The glue holding these boxes together is really something. It's basically impossible to open the box without destroying it. I just hope the phone isn't the same. For those who haven't watched my previous teardown and repair assessment videos, I've purchased two devices so I can not only take them apart and see the internals, but also simulate repair by interchanging parts. Many tech companies have incorporated anti-third-party repair software that blocks replacement parts. With nothing being new to the phone world, it'll be interesting to see what approach they've taken. Not being able to order a white one, I've got a hold of two black units. The design of this phone is similar to my custom iPhone 10 I built a few years back. The big difference is the Nothing phone has lights on the back. The lights can be used for several things, including a video light or notifications. I'll set up both phones and program in my fingerprint to establish a baseline before we take the phones to pieces. Both phones are running Nothing OS 1.1.2 with the July 2022 security patch. Given all the screws visible through the transparent back, I'm going to assume this phone opens from the back. It'll need to be heated up on a heat plate for several minutes prior to attempting to remove the back glass. A suction cup can be used to pull up on the glass, creating a gap where the plastic pick can be inserted. Running the pick around the perimeter, I can slice through the adhesive. I'll need to be mindful of the coiled cable in the left corner and all of the LED strips. Lifting up the glass, things look almost identical, but we now have access to the all important screws. Getting a look at the rear panel, you can see it has been slightly tinted. Before proceeding any further, I'm going to get the back off my other Nothing phone. From a glance, the internals of this phone look unlike any other. So where do I even begin? Well, there's a number of aesthetic details that serve no purpose other than to cover up aspects of the phone. We'll need to remove those first so we can access the screws beneath. At the base of the phone, the lower LED array can be unadhered. I'll need to pry carefully as there's a cable attaching it to the charging port beneath. Removing the cable was the first of this phone's complications. With no repair manual, I wasn't sure on how this metal bracket functioned. I attempted to pry it free at all four sides, but it wouldn't budge. In the end, I discovered you need to pull back on the rubber piece on the left before pressing it down and to the left with tweezers on the other side of the bracket. A very complicated process for a very tiny piece. Next, there was another aesthetic detail to remove before I could unfasten the torque screws securing this piece of plastic. Again, I was facing a problem. For some reason, this piece of plastic just wouldn't come out. I could see that it was clipped in at the front, but I couldn't get the clip to budge. As it turns out, hiding a screw under one layer wasn't enough. So they also put a liquid indication sticker on top to hide it further. Once the screw was out, it still took some force to remove. Unfortunately, in doing so, I damaged the fingerprint reader cable. This is the first casualty in any of my teardown videos. However, despite the small tear in the cable, the fingerprint reader miraculously still works. So I obviously didn't damage any of the important traces in the wire. When you remove this piece of plastic, you'll find the metal bracket and its rubber retainer. Initially, I thought I'd damage something else as this piece of plastic isn't very strong. Next, the interconnect flex cable can be unplugged and unadhered from the speaker and wireless charging coil. Yes, some of the visible internals are real, 
The wireless charging coil, however, isn't. The real coil is under the plastic decal. At the top, I can remove the earpiece speaker before unplugging the center LED array and flash. There is then a series of torque screws that I can remove before lifting up the wireless charging coil. It can't be removed entirely as its cable runs under the plastic, so I'll just have to fold it over. With it out of the way, we have revealed yet more hidden screws, one of which is under another liquid indicator. Oddly, these screws are Phillips. And just when I thought there was no place left to hide a screw, I was again proven wrong. Lifting up the camera LED array reveals two more Torx screws. But with 16 screws out, we can finally get our first look at the motherboard of the phone. It's astounding what we have to remove to get this far. This is easily shaping up as one of the hardest Android phones to repair. But with the glyph interface and aesthetics removed, the phone now has a familiar feel. We can now also get a look at the two 50 megapixel cameras and the 4,500 milliamp hour battery. I'll need to repeat this same grueling process on the second phone. However, this time I avoided removing anything from the lower section. Loosening the coiled cable allowed for just enough clearance to free the wireless charging coil. With both phones open, it's time we dig a little deeper and begin doing some testing. I've labelled both phones 1 and 2 to help us differentiate between the devices. Usually colour helps with this, but as I mentioned, the white model was out of stock. I'll remove the motherboard so we can get a closer look at it. Unlike the rest of the teardown so far, this was a simple and straightforward process, only being held in with one screw. This base configuration motherboard features a Snapdragon 778G+, 8GB of RAM and 128GB of storage. Removing the motherboard on the second device will allow us to swap the two, in turn simulating the replacement of every single part inside the phone. Many probably think that nothing should happen, and rightly so, but that's often not the case. On a repair friendly phone, everything will continue to work or give you the option to configure the new parts. But some phones prevent new parts from working, disable features or display warning messages. The most profound example being the iPhone. What software locks will this phone have? Hopefully, nothing. I'll loosely attach everything back together so we can test the phone. Upon boot, everything appears fine and no repair related messages appear. But right away, I found the fingerprint reader wouldn't attempt to scan my fingerprint. As the sensor is from another phone, it's unlikely that it would unlock without the need to reprogram my fingerprint. However, I couldn't do so. The phone detected my finger, but refused to scan. Even though it was still working, I did slightly damage the fingerprint cable. So the result cannot be conclusive without running the same test on the other device. I never removed the lower portion on this phone, so there's no chance of any damage. On the second device, results were the same. Fingerprint function is completely lost without warning. I continued my tests with the cameras. All lenses and modes are working. I also tested things such as the glyph interface, auto brightness and display refresh rate. Based on my testing, no other functions have been affected by the swap in parts. For good measure, I'll reset the phone and see if the fingerprint function returns. This isn't the only phone I've seen with this issue. Google's Pixel 6 line requires calibration after a display replacement. Google provides this tool for free on their website. I found nothing for this phone, so it appears I'll have to see if I can resolve it on my own. A reset proved useless, so it was time to dig into the operating system to see if I could find any hidden apps that might help me out. One internal testing app says my fingerprint is working correctly, however verifying in settings I still get the same result. Various other tests pass with flying colours. Other internal apps display things such as device info or the ability to configure various things for just about everything, including the amount of radio frequency, but not the fingerprint. One fun app I found was to test the glyph interface. Lastly, I found a logger app which allows you to capture problems. I ran the program and briefly assessed the log output, but didn't find anything I could use. I think it's fair to say there currently isn't a way to replace the fingerprint sensor. What if you were to install a new screen? Would you also be sacrificing the fingerprint function? 
I'll swap the sensors between the phones, resulting in the motherboard and fingerprint reader matching while all other parts remain foreign. The optical sensor is located under the USB-C port and comes out easily. I occasionally hear from supporters of anti-repair. Their biggest drive seems to be the belief if you can change the fingerprint reader, someone could easily hack your phone. While it could be possible, I think it's important for those people to know that your pin code is required after a reboot, and there's only a set number of attempts, usually around five, meaning you can't brute force the passcode. A possible workaround for everyone is to have the mechanic in place where the new part is disabled until it's re-enabled in the OS, kind of like unlocking the bootloader. And if your threat model is really that high, you shouldn't be using fingerprints. Stick to a long pin or complex password. Having the motherboard and fingerprint sensor match has resulted in a working fingerprint sensor, confirming the Nothing Phone contains software pairing. The final aspect of this phone we have yet to remove is the battery, a consumable component that will degrade over time and inevitably need replacement. Unlike the rest of the device, the battery has a pull tab, almost inviting me to remove it. But it's held down with some serious glue, so it's back to the heat plate for a minute before I can try again. With the heat having softened the adhesive, the battery can now come free. And with that, we've now disassembled the Nothing Phone 1. The transparent back might entice tinkerers and repairers into thinking it's open and repair friendly, but as we've seen, that's not really the case. It's now time we reassemble both phones with their original parts. It's good to see the USB-C port as modular, along with many other components, but it's a shame the phone is just so involved to disassemble. It's hard to know what to expect from a new phone company, but now having disassembled these phones a few times, I've become more familiar with their design. A repair manual is greatly needed given its complexity. Going in totally unaware, it's surprising I didn't break anything. What do you think of the glyph lights? I suppose it's not a design everyone's going to like, but I actually think it's kind of neat. Not sure how much use it'll provide, but I'll give them credit. It's different, and I like that. One thing I've also discovered is that the wireless charging coil must be attached, otherwise the phone won't power up. Once all the screws are attached, I'll go ahead and plug in the lower LED array. Just like its removal, there's a trick to getting this pesky bracket attached. After it's loosely attached, you need to open it slightly and push the rubber retainer behind it, before locking the bracket into place. Without the rubber piece, it won't stay closed. I'd also recommend installing some new adhesive before reattaching the LEDs. The last thing needed is a good clean. This is especially important as the back is transparent. Any poor repair work will show itself. Proceeding, the back panel can be reattached. I'll have to repeat this process for the other device. It's important to install new adhesive before attaching the glass, but as this phone is fresh off the market, there is not yet any replacements, so it'll only be loosely attached for now. With both phones reassembled, we're done. So this is it, nothing's first smartphone. The unique aesthetic and design complicates repairs. Along with a software locked fingerprint reader, this has proven to be the hardest to repair Android phone I've seen so far. Personally, the iPhone is still holding out as number one because of lasers being required for a back glass replacement and its greater presence and impact from software locks. Like my iPhone 12 and 13 videos, there was enough outcry that we did make a small change. So nothing can still do something and fix the fingerprint issue, but only time will tell. And on that note, this has been a Hugh Jeffries video. If you like what you saw, hit that subscribe button and consider checking out the Teardown and Repair Assessment playlist for more videos just like this one. And if you're looking for any used devices, be sure to check out my online store, link for which is down in the description. That's all for this video, and I'll catch you guys next time.